Well, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, welcome to Multnomah Group's October webinar and our annual 2023 regulatory update. I uh, appreciate you all taking some time to go through some of the actions or some of the activities that we've seen over the past year relative to uh, retirement plans, mostly focusing on defined contribution plans. So my name is Greg Johnson. I'm a senior consultant and director of our ERISA technical services here at Multnomah Group. And joining me today is retirement plan analyst Candace Finn and also third year law student at Lewis and Clark. <clears throat> So for today's presentation, we'll uh, go over the legislative update, IRS update, Department of Labor, and then talk about some of what's happening as for, on the litigation front. So for the legislative update, I would say most of the year is spent reacting to SECURE 2.0. And while SECURE was technically passed at the very end of 2022, I think uh, practitioners in the field have spent most of the year sort of deciphering how the rules will function. Uh, trying to identify where we need additional guidance. And at the same time, plan sponsors and record keepers, I think, have spent most of the year trying to figure out how to administer a lot of these provisions, especially some of the optional ones. Um, on the IRS front, the IRS was fairly quiet as it relates to retirement plans until private providing some much needed relief to one of the mandatory provisions of SECURE, which we'll go into a little more detail. Um, on the DOL front, the DOL found itself uh, sort of reacting to pushback from uh, some political forces, from some rules related to socially responsible investing, and also uh, responding to comments related to the use of things like cryptocurrency and retirement plans. So we'll go into that a little bit. And then we'll close it out with uh, uh, a review of some of the, there's still plenty of uh, litigation relative to retirement plans, but we're going to focus on some of the cases that maybe highlight uh, what your fiduciary responsibility is as a plan sponsor. All right, for those who might not be as familiar with Multnomah Group, we are a comprehensive retirement plan consulting firm that is our primary focus. Uh, we currently uh, serve as fiduciaries and co-fiduciaries on about 266 plans representing over $28 billion in assets. We have nine consultants in different states across the country, um, <clears throat> and, and we are continuing to grow. So um, let's move into the legislative update. Um, you know, I said most of the year was spent reacting to Secure 2.0. Um, we put a lot of information out throughout the year, so I don't want this to be uh, necessarily a deep dive on Secure 2.0, but I do think we wanna go over some of the more uh, meaningful provisions. Uh, the way we've structured this is we're going to go year by year looking at the mandatory provisions first and then looking at the many, many optional provisions. So with that, I think I'll turn it over to Candace to talk about uh, initially some of the changes to required minimum distribution rules. Thanks, Greg. So yeah, as Greg said, just kind of a quick over high overview of this. So first off, Section 107, required minimum, minimum distributions. Um, beginning date. So that'll be an increase for, increase for the RMD age from 72 to 73, and again from 73 to 75 in 2023 later on. Um, this, of course, will be effective for individuals who turn 72 after January 1st, 2023. Uh, next is Section 302, reduction for the penalty of failure to take RMDs. Um, that moves from 50% to 25%. And if it's actually corrected timely, the excise tax on that failure is then further reduced from 25% uh, to 10%. Yeah, that's a pretty welcome change, right? That was, yes. a, that was a significant penalty, paying 50% of your required minimum distribution if you missed it. I'm sure the IRS is thrilled about that. <laughs> <laughs> um. So next up is uh, Section 325. So this is, of course, the extension for pre-death RMDs exemption to Roth IRAs uh, in plan Roth amounts, which means that participants do not have to roll over plan assets into an IRA just to avoid being required to begin taking those RMDs. Um, note, this doesn't apply, you know, distributions that are required before January 1st, 2024, but are permitted to be paid out after January 1st. So be kind of careful with that. Um, and then hopefully they'll help minimize the number of participants with Roth money that roll it over to their Roth just to avoid the prior retirement plan requirements uh, to make RMDs from their account. Next is Section 327, uh, surviving spouse treated as a deceased employee for purposes of RMD. This is really great. You know, the two big benefits here 
are, you know, they may elect to delay their initial RMD until later in that year that they reach 73 or when the participant would have reached 73. And then additionally, the annual RMD calculation will be based on that uniform lifetime table instead of a single lifetime table that's Any other provision? This was going to be mandatory. This is going to be mandatory, effective January 1st of this year. And I think uh, there are a variety of reasons why it was proving to be challenging from an administrative standpoint. Uh, there were some, uh, some requests for new legislation to remove this or change it in some manner. Um, but we'll talk a little more about what the relief is that the IRS uh, provided when we get into that section. Uh, more future mandatory provisions, section 101 says new plans must include auto enroll and auto escalate. This is effective 2025, but it's really important to note that really any plan, new plan established after 2023, even though it might not have auto enroll and auto escalate at the time it was created, it does need to add it by 2025. And, you know, I know some people look at that and they're like, well, I already have a plan, so this won't, <clears throat> won't impact me, and, or this is only for new startup plans. Um, you know, there are things that happen that result in people closing two plans and opening a new one, um, mergers and acquisitions. So I think there are situations where new plans are created even for uh, existing large companies. And if they do create a new plan, they are going to have to auto-enroll everyone at 3% is the rule, and then you auto escalate 1% each year up to 10%. <clears throat> Section 125 is another mandatory provision. Uh, you know, the two biggest ones that I think were the 603, that Roth provision, and Section 125 here rel related to the long term part time employees. Now, 125 included the SECURE Act, included a three year requirement. So uh, Long-term part-time employees working over 500 hours, three years in a row, had to be allowed into the plan. Now, you don't have to do an employer match form, um, but the original SECURE Act only applied to the 401ks. So a 401k plan that had someone working over 500 hours for three years in a row had to allow that individual to do voluntary uh, contributions. For those individuals, they would be eligible beginning in 2024. So you should have been tracking that over the last three years. Section 125 changed in Secure 2.0, changed the rules a little bit. First, it extended it to 403B plans. Uh, and second, it shortened the time frame to only two years. So for 2025, uh, individuals who have two years of over 500 hours uh, must be allowed to do voluntary contributions. <clears throat> Uh, Section 501, for all these changes that we're talking about, al almost everyone's going to have to amend their plan. Uh, the timing for doing plan amendments is that they must be completed by the end of the first plan year, beginning on or after January 1st, 2025. So we do have some time before you have to put in the amendments for some of these mandatory and optional provisions that we'll be talking about. Another mandatory provision that doesn't begin until 2026 uh, which seems a little counterintuitive given sort of the direction that we're going with electronics and or electronic and computers, but uh, DC plans must send a paper statement once a year to all participants and DB plans must send one uh, every three years. So those are the mandatory provisions. Like I said, I think that as a plan sponsor, you know, your record keeper is going to take care of a lot of these things, especially uh, related to RMDs and things like that. I think the biggest ones that require your attention uh, again, 603, we'll talk about the delay, but I wouldn't stop working on it. Uh, that is going to come eventually. And then also tracking of long-term part-time employees. Uh, before I turn it over to Candace to talk about uh, some of the uh, optional provisions, I should mention a quick housekeeping item. We do have the Q&A uh, feature available. Uh, we do have a fair amount of information to go over, but we will try and answer questions along the way. So if you have any questions, please feel free to use that. Good thinking, Greg. Now we'll look at some of the optional provisions, Candace. Awesome, thanks. 
Yeah, so first step for 2023 um, is section 113. This is de, minim de minimis financial incentives to encourage participation. So it's of course, uh, small, inc small incentives for uh, contributions to the plan. I will note that the IRS has yet to define um, de minimis. So I think that's something where we're looking for some guidance on of what that actually really looks like. Uh, next is section 301, which is the recovery of overpay plan overpayments. Um, you know, if a, a player may elect not to seek the recoupment of these overpayments too, so it's kind of up to you as a plan sponsor of whether you want to take that on. And if seeking the recoupment, the employer must abide by really certain rules when seeking that um, that is designed to protect the participant. So something to kind of be aware of should you're going through with that. Yeah, this section one's a little weird. I did, we, we put it in here as an optional provision, but you're right, Candace. It's the optional portion is if there's a plan overpayment, you really, it allows you to not go try and get that back. That's through the optional portion. Uh, but also in this section, if you do decide I'm going to go try and get that money back from the participant, it does have some rules that you do have to follow in, in the way you conduct your uh, trying to get that money back. Mm -hmm. It's very specific. Uh, next is section 311. So that's the repayment of qualified birth and adoption distributions. Of course, this was from the original act. Um, and now this is just saying, hey, you have those three years to pay that back. You know, the provision will allow for a $5,000 penalty free withdrawal that was included in the SECURE Act. And this clarifies how the repayment is over the three years. Uh, section 312 is the employee self-certification for hardship distributions. So this is that employees may self-certify that a hardship distribution is an immediate financial need. And that amount does not need to exceed that need. Like it can't exceed that need. So that's one of those things. And um, if they have no other means of meeting that need as well. So it really must be a true hardship. You know, one of the things here too, as part of the self-certification is if you as an employer know that that's not really what it is, something you know, to kind of keep aware of, this is kind of a, a sticky situation one, um, but it does thankfully put a lot of that responsibility on the participant. Section 312, uh, simplified notice requirements for non-participating employees. Um, so this is one where, you know, I think is, as Greg was saying earlier with, hey, we're getting back to some paper, this one might be a little bit different in the sense of, you know, it allows eligible but not participating employees that are only required to receive that one annual notice reminder. Uh, section 326 is penalty free withdrawals for terminal illness. So this one you actually need a physician certified uh, terminal illness notice um, that would be a terminal illness that would result in death within seven years that may be allowed. You know, this is a little bit different than how the IRS actually defines terminal illness for I think other tables. So something to be aware of here, you know, the years, the physician notice that's needed for that. Um, Last, of course, is Section 331, the penalty-free withdrawals uh, for declared federal disasters. This is withdrawals up to $22,000 within 108, 180 days of the declared disaster. Um, this is inclusion in the gross income and could be spread over those three years. Anything I missed, Greg? No, you know, I, I think the terminal illness one, uh, that's, something's got to change on that, right? Because that's pretty sensitive. I mean, you don't want to go to your employer with a doctor's note that says you have a terminal illness. That's, you know, that's information that's generally considered protected. So I think that's one that we're going to definitely see some additional guidance on. Um, also, the declared federal disasters. I mean, for anyone who's heard me uh, talk about access to retirement plan funds for things other than retirement, uh, know that I'm generally not a huge fan of opening up the retirement system. Uh, for a variety of different needs, which uh, honestly, that's a lot of what S Secure 2.0 is, is opening up for uh, access to retirement for a variety of different situations. Um, but the declared federal disaster one is one that I think is a welcome change. I mean, before this, it, it literally did take an act of Congress to get relief for a federal disaster, and only the largest federal disasters were uh, being given the opportunity to access any, money, any retirement money. So uh, well, again, I'm not a huge supporter of letting people just take money out of their retirement plan, but uh, that is one that's probably pretty favorable overall. <clears throat> Going on to some of the optional provisions for 2024. Uh, the first one, I think a lot of you probably are aware that student loans are going are going to have to be repaid again. Uh, that's starting this month. Um, and this provision allows for student loan payments can qualify for an employer matching contribution. So if you have a matching plan, 
and the student can show or prove that they were making student loan payments in the amount that they needed to be putting into the retirement plan, the employer can put that money into their retirement account. Um, this was one that I originally thought seemed pretty complex and I wasn't sure how it was going to be administered. It seemed like it was going to be more of a heavy lift for a plan sponsor to track the student loans. As I've looked into it a little more, though, I, I think this might actually become a pretty popular feature. Um, obviously, student debt is a big issue in the United States, and it does look like you could do this where you just do it once a year. So at the end of the year, you could get uh, some sort of certification from the employee that they've made student loan payments, and then you can just put one matching contribution in. So uh, this is one that I think a lot of people will be asking about. Uh, Penalty-free withdrawals for emergency expenses. There were two types of uh, two provisions related to emergency savings. In Section 115, the penalty-free withdrawals of up to $1,000 for emergency expenses is probably the easiest. So I think if a plan sponsor said, you know, we should provide some access, you know, people have large balances here. If they do have an emergency come up, we should provide some degree of access. Uh, this would allow them to take $1,000 directly out of their retirement plan savings. Um, again, probably easier to administer uh, and monitor than, than the second option, which is Section 127. Section 127 creates sort of a sidecar account of up to $2,500. So this is a, uh, an account that is held separate and distinct from the retirement savings. Uh, the plan sponsor has to select what type of very safe investment uh, vehicle will be used. My guess is the record keepers will uh, we'll come up with ways to support these sidecar accounts and we'll probably make recommendations of what investment to use. But again, it's another another way to sort of have the, the money set aside for an emergency um, that I think is maybe a little more administrative, admit, administratively complex than just using Section 115 and saying if people can come and say they have emergency, they have access to money. 304, increase the small sum force out. So plans are allowed to push out uh, inactive balances currently of $5,000 or less. If it's 1,000 or less, it, uh, it can go out in cash. If it's 1,000 to 5,000, it has to be rolled over to an IRA. That amount is increasing up to $7,000. I mentioned earlier the, you know, the deadline for plan amendments. Most plans that I have seen that allow for small sum force outs typically say $5,000. So you do want to look at your plan. And if you do want to start taking advantage of the $7,000 uh, increase, the, the increase by $2,000, you likely will have to amend your plan to do that. Penalty free withdrawal for victims of domestic abuse. This is another opportunity for people to access their money. The rule here, you can self certify. Uh, the rule does state, though, that the abuse uh, must have happened within the last 12 months, but a, a person can self-certify that that is the case. Uh, Section 604 is another pretty big one. Employer contributions can be made as after-tax Roth contributions. So for this one, uh, you know, this one actually Candace pointed out uh, probably what could be an issue with this. So if, if your employer is putting in $5,000 for you currently, it currently goes in as regular contributions and you're taxed on the, on the, earn, on the contribution and earnings when, when the money comes out. If it goes in as a Roth contribution, it doesn't appear that there's any withholding on that. So my only concern with this is a participant who maybe was entitled to $5,000 of employer contributions, when they go to do their taxes, they won't have had any withholding on that amount. And they could find that they're facing a, a pretty significant tax bill that they're not expecting. That's really the only issue I see with this. I think if people and employers want to offer the opportunity to do after-tax Roth contributions, they could certainly do so. Uh, Candace, why don't we move over to you for the last optional provisions? Perfect. So 325, Section 109, these are higher catch-up limits for individuals age uh, 60 to 63, so that's uh, the greater of $10,000, which would be index, or 150% of the regular catch-up. So, of course, you'll still have the regular limit for the 50-plus, which for 2023 was $7,500. That'll also be indexed, so that's still there. This just allows for an additional higher catch-up limit for um, individuals within that age bracket. 
2026 section 334, this permits DC plans to allow qualified distribution for long-term care distributions, uh, distributions for long-term care insurance premiums. So you can take that, if you take a distribution out, you can use it to pay that premium for the long-term care insurance. Um, you know, this is of course the amount the employee pays is gonna be certified with the um, long-term care insurance. It's 10% of the present value of the employee's accrued benefit under the plan or 25% adjusted for inflation. I mean, $2,500 adjusted for inflation after 2024. So there's a, a little bit critical of what you can take out and how it's used. It's very specific. So just something to kind of note there. Section 103, of course, is uh, the savers match. So instead of a cash tax credit of what it used to be, an eligible qualified retirement savings contribution of up to $2,000 per year is eligible for a federal matching deposit of up to 50% into the applicable retirement savings vehicle. So um, there's a phase out for this as well with income. So just something to note, this is really meant for uh, lower income individuals. There's um, thresholds for joint filers, head of households and singles. So something to kind of check with if you're thinking of implementing this, but of course this isn't until 2027. Uh, anything else for optional provisions, Greg, before we move on to the IRS update? No, I think, you know, the savers match, I think it's good that the government has several years before that goes into effect. Because what, what that's going to do, you know, in the old savers match, it was, a um, you know, when you're filling out your taxes, you got the credit. Uh, this is actually going to have the federal government making a direct contribution to that individual's retirement plan. So uh, the plan sponsor will have to allow contributions to come in of that type. So that's why it's optional. We do have a question here about what is the deadline for implementing optional provisions? And I had to think about that one for a little bit because uh, it, it's a good question because I think you have all these optional provisions. Um, I'm not aware of any deadline for opting in. So I, I think any plan sponsor can add these anytime they want. Um, but when you look at it, I, I think there's at least eight optional provisions that mostly give employees access to, to retirement funds. And I think as a plan sponsor, what I would be looking at or what I would be considering is, number one, do I want to further open up my retirement plan to provide access to people? Or do I want to really sort of keep it what it was created for to help people save for retirement. Um, but if someone does come and say, hey, I want to, I'd like to have access to emergency savings. Uh, once you start considering one of the optional provisions, I probably wouldn't just move quickly and say, well, let's just add that one. I, I would maybe take a minute to sit down and think about what is the full list of optional provisions? Do we want to add all of them right now at one time? Do we just have, want to add a few? Or do we just wait till people come in one by one? I would probably prefer to either do it all or nothing. That's just, uh, that, that's just would be my preference. But just a couple things to think about there relative to all of these optional provisions. And there's, there's a lot of them, right? Greg, what do you think from a, do you think probably checking with record keepers, you know, do you think a lot of them will be able to administer a lot of these provisions? Well, that, that's a great point. I mean, I, as, as you're considering, if someone approaches you and says, hey, we want to add this provision, probably the first thing I'd do is call my record keeper and ask, uh, you know, what their plan is for record keeping it and making sure that they've sort of put in the, the proper manner of tracking. Uh, you know, the interesting thing about all these rules, I mean, if I were a record keeper and saw these rules, I'd be like, oh my gosh, how, how am I going to keep track of all these? Because every one of these probably requires its own distribution code. Uh, its own tracking. Many of these can be paid back. So you have to determine what's this payback going towards if there were multiple uh, withdrawals. So there is some complexity to the administration of all these uh, optional provisions. So I, I would definitely start with your record keeper and understand how they plan on managing that particular provision that you're considering adding. <clears throat> All right, I mentioned the IRS was fairly quiet until notice 2023-62, which provided administrative transition period for that Roth catch-up provision. Uh, I mentioned that there were calls to the legislature to provide some new legislation to change this provision. Uh, a lot of concerns about how this was going to be administered, especially if it was effective 1124. So this extends it to 1126. And basically what the administrative transition period uh, says is that any catch-up contributions that are made on a pre-tax basis by individuals earning over $145,000, those will be treated as satisfying the rule. 
In addition, any catch-up contributions made in plans that do not currently offer Roth savings will also be treated as satisfying the rule. That notice also indicated that the IRS plans to provide some additional guidance on how this rule is going to apply to individuals who do not have FICA wages. Uh, it's going to additional guidance on the employer record keeper treatment of how these pre-tax contributions are supposed to be record kept, and then also some guidance on multiple employer plans. So if an employee is in a, a MAP or a multiple employer plans and has income from two different employers, they're going to provide some guidance on, on, well, the guidance is going to say that it doesn't, you don't combine the income from those two employers for purposes of the 145000 uh, this was a much needed rule. I, I knew something was going to happen relative to this rule. I didn't know it was coming from coming for the IRS, um, but it was much needed and very welcome. I did have someone ask me, so does that mean that the, that money that goes in, it goes in pre-tax, is it categorized as Roth savings? And sorry, you can't have your cake and eat it too. Uh, I am certain that it will continue to be categorized as pre-tax and you will pay taxes on it when it comes time to take it out. Basically what they're saying is we're just not going to uh, apply the rule until 2026. Two other notices from the IRS. Uh, one of them is relative to some provisions in the SECURE Act, which is a review and expansion of what is available for self-correction. So I think anytime you identify an issue within your plan, uh, if you have the opportunity to self-correct it, you certainly want to do that. And the opportunity to correct more uh, operational errors and others will be extended. Uh, the other one is some additional RMD relief. Uh, ineligible designated beneficiaries, which is primarily non-spouse beneficiaries, um, they will be granted relief from RMD requirements where the deceased was taking the RMDs. So this rule came in a couple of years ago uh, with the deceased individual. Uh, so the ineligible designated beneficiary has to deplete the account within 10 years. The way the rule was designed was if the deceased was already taking RMDs, that beneficiary is supposed to continue taking those RMDs, but that was not very clear in the regulations. So this is relief to for individuals that did not take their RMDs. Uh, similar, uh, Candace talked at the beginning, we all know that RMDs went from 72 to 73. Uh, Secure 2.0 was passed on, I think, December 29th or something of 2022. So some individuals who take their RMDs at the very beginning of the year might not have been aware of the fact that they didn't have to take the RMD if they weren't hadn't turned 73. So this provides some relief for that as well. So next we want to move into the uh, Department of Labor update. Uh, one of the first things in February 2023, the DOL issued their final ESG rule relative to socially responsible investing. Uh, I think I'll turn it over to Candace to just give a quick review of what that rule was. Yeah, thanks, Greg. So I think as everyone's seen over the last several years, kind of the ping ponging between uh, where ESG has been going. Um, but this new rule has actually removed several provisions of the old rule and will make it easier for retirement plans to use ESG factors and ESG focused products. So. Of course, those four components of the new rule are listed here, so fiduciaries may take ESG factors into consideration when making investment decisions. Same considerations can be used for your, QD, uh, for your QDIA. Uh, when comparing similar funds, those collateral benefits can be used you know, as a tiebreaker if you're looking at two different funds to potentially include in, within your investment menu, and you can consider uh, participants' non-financial preferences. Um, so I think one of the biggest changes here to the provision is allowing a fiduciary to consider those plan participants' non-financial preferences and construction of the investment menu. You know, the order is pretty clear about taking a participant's input in, into consideration uh, that it's not a violation of the duty of loyalty. So um, just kind of high-level overview, since I think we've really been hounding ESG. I'll turn it over to Greg to kind of give some eval. Yeah, I mean, this is definitely, ESG investing is, absolutely become a very uh, hot political topic, uh, both in and out of retirement savings. Uh, this rule just expanded, you know, it, it, first off, it's optional, right? So it doesn't say that you have to take ESG factors into consideration. I think when the proposed rule came out, 
Uh, some people, there, I think there was one sentence that maybe could be interpreted that said you needed to take ESG factors into consideration. That was never the intent of the DOL, uh, you know, and that was, of course, removed. So, you know, the first thing is it is optional, but it did come under almost immediate fire. Uh, very quickly, legislative action was taken to overturn the rule, and this it, it did pass. And President Biden actually used his very first veto in office to retain the rule in, in its current form. Uh, in addition, 26 red state attorney generals have challenged the legality of the rule and the process followed, the administrative process followed to introduce the rule. And I mean, interestingly, uh, this case was filed in federal court, I think in the Northern District of Texas. Uh, there was only one federal judge in, in that district uh, so there was some concerns that uh, these 26 attorney generals were doing a little uh, judge shopping to get someone who would rule in their favor. This particular judge uh, does, does have a very strong track record of uh, supporting Trump initiatives and not supporting Biden initiatives. So uh, initially, the DOL tried to get it moved to another venue and was unsuccessful. Just in the last couple of weeks, though, that judge did rule that the DOL, that the, the, the rule is legal and the administrative process that the DOL followed was appropriate. So uh, I don't know what's gonna come next. I think they could certainly appeal, these attorney generals could appeal, but uh, the initial win is to, the, is to the Department of Labor. Another sort of interesting challenge to it, and we could have put this in our, in our um, litigation update, but uh, it's part of this as well. There was a lawsuit filed by a former American Airlines pilot alleging that the 401k committee took ESG factors into consideration and that negatively affected the overall investment performance. This one is interesting because a trial date has been set for next summer, but there's also a motion to dismiss that's being considered. It's a little unusual for the judge to put a trial date out there if if he or she is going to uh, to grant the motion to dismiss the case. Uh, so that is certainly an indicator that it will move forward. But one interesting piece of this is it looks like the only place that the ESG funds were available was through a self-directed brokerage account, which typically, uh, you know, you don't have any fiduciary responsibility over. So I think this is one that we want to keep an eye on, but I initially expected, fully expected it to be dismissed, but it might not be. Another area for the Department of Labor was some guidance on cybersecurity best or uh, another area that actually the DOL issued guidance on back in 2021 was cybersecurity best practices. And uh, for those of you who are familiar with the Move It data breach that happened in May of 2023, it impacted several prominent retirement plan record keepers. A lot of these record keepers were using a third party provider to support their uh, work relative to identifying beneficiaries and uh, identifying deceased individuals. Uh, it was a large amount of data. It was a significant data breach. The company that was impacted uh, reached out to everyone who had their uh, data compromised and offered two years of free credit monitoring. Um, <clears throat> but it's just an important reminder that, you know, you, as a plan sponsor, you are transmitting a lot of personally identifiable information to and from your record keeper on a very regular basis. So while this was a very public data breach, I, I sort of used it as an opportunity to remind plan sponsors to maybe take a look at what your cybersecurity protocols are, review the DOL guidance, and make sure you are in line with all of that. The the Department of Labor also puts out sort of what their future focus is, and I'll turn it over to Candace to sort of talk about uh, some of the things that they're focusing on, some of the pre-rule and final rule items. Awesome, thanks. Yeah, so in the EBSA's kind of future focus in the pre-rule stages are uh, improving participant disclosure. So the EBSA was tasked with finding ways to improve retirement plan disclosures to enhance, hopefully, Outcomes for employees, you know, will consultant plan, they're actually going to talk with consultants and plan sponsors and other stakeholders to kind of explore ways to potentially improve disclosures. Uh, PEP guidance, so Secure Act 2019 amended ERISA to allow PEPs to be able to have a type of single employer pension benefit plan, and the EBSA will begin exploring kind of the needs for regulatory regulatory guidance to run these plans. Uh, emergency savings guidance and retirement lost and found, so um, these are kind of coming out of Secure 2.0. Uh, 
one of the big things within a lot of the provisions of Secure 2.0 was it did direct the Treasury as well as the Department of Labor to provide guidance on a lot of different provisions. These are kind of two of those ones. So the it's particularly the lost and found one that was to create a national online lost and found database for Americans to track their retirement records. Uh, you know, we talk about a lot about missing participants sometimes, and hopefully, I think they're hoping this is potentially a uh, fix or a patch or something to hopefully allow people to have uh, better access to their retirement savings. Next, we'll move on to the proposed stage rules. So I think a lot of people have really been talking about this one, the definition of a fiduciary. So the DOL proposed to amend the ERISA a definition to more closely reflect today's uh, relationships between participants, service providers, uh, and other investment advice that was carried over. You know, this was originally on the 2021 agenda. We're seeing this picked up again. Um, the 5500 data requirements, so this is hopefully a modernization of the 5500 forms to make investment data more available to be reviewed. Um, I think some people would say like mind or where people can go in and, and really review the data better. better. Uh, this was also another item that was carried over from the 2021 agenda. And then last is the um, Epgers transaction eligible for self-correction. So um, the EBSA took comments on this in January. Uh, and I think they're still looking at this overall throughout the year, despite the fact that it's October. Last is final stage rules. So this has been really interesting because the mandatory lifetime income illustration rules. Uh, Secure Act added the lifetime income illustration requirements for certain DC plans. Many were looking at a final rule in May. I you've yet to see anything posted about that. Uh, and additionally, for the prohibitive transaction exemption procedures, I know there's been actually, I think, a, a case that um, Greg's going to be talking about later for prohibited, prohibited transactions. They were expecting a final rule on this in April, uh, and the DOL is still, I think, processing this. Yeah, the definition of fiduciary, fiduciary that's, that's going to be the next battle that the DOL is going to face. I think people are already lining up to challenge that. The proposed rule has been sent to the OMB for review, and I do expect that it'll probably be, be out in the next month or so. So I think that's probably the next big thing that's coming down the pike. <clears throat> so let's talk about some of the litigation. Uh, just an update on what's going on. Actually, you know, it seems like there's still plenty of ERISA litigation. I think we've actually seen some indicators that it may be slowing down a bit. Um, but we are seeing a few different kinds of, of cases coming up as well. So uh, in the past, we've spent a lot of time talking about some of the higher education litigation. Uh, that's been relatively quiet. Really, the only big case that we saw was this Yale University case. And this one was definitely a head scratcher. Uh, first, it went to a jury trial, which is a little unusual. Um, and you really don't get a whole lot from the jury trial. You just sort of get what their decision was. You don't get a lot of the basis. So from a, you know, from helping either plaintiffs or defendants as, as they navigate other cases. I didn't see a lot in here that really helps. But the unique thing about it is the jury trial actually did identify a breach of fiduciary duty by the, uh, by the retirement plan committee. But oddly, they determined that other prudent fiduciaries could have made the same decisions that the Yale committee made. So they actually did identify a breach of fiduciary duty, but then sort of let them off the hook by saying, well, but other prudent fiduciaries could have come to the same conclusion and made the same decision. So the penalties were zero. So honestly, I don't know what this, I don't get a lot out of this. Uh, I think if I were a plaintiff's uh, counsel, I would be very pleased to see the breach of fiduciary duty, but obviously very disappointed that the damages were zero. Uh, another one that I, I think highlights the use of managed accounts is this Dover Corporation. And <clears throat> this is allegations of excessive fees related to the use of financial engines. The reason I uh, highlighted this one is managed accounts are a pretty popular offer in retirement plans. And I just want to take a second to sort of explain how they operate and how they function. Generally, it is something that is chosen by the individual. So the plan offers the ability to have a managed account, which is sort of an enhanced asset allocation service, but it doesn't apply to everyone. It only applies to individuals who select to use the managed account service. In return, those individuals pay an additional fee. So it's only at the participant level. So the plan isn't paying it. I do believe sometimes these are positioned as 
Well, it's just individuals are using it. If they want to use it, they can pay for it. If they don't want to use it, they don't pay for it. So you as a plan sponsor, you might have as not, not as much fiduciary responsibility or oversight relative to that managed account, people opt in or opt out. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think that is not the case. And I think it'll continue to see an increased focus on these managed accounts. So if you do offer managed accounts in your plan, uh, I would absolutely look at what the use is what the sales practices are by the record keeper that's offering them and, and what the take rate is. Because I think if you see a, a dramatic increase in the take rate of these managed accounts, you do want to monitor how much money is the record keeper making off of these managed accounts relative to what we're paying for uh, just overall record keeping for the plan. So there's definitely a cost. It is being paid by participants, but you do want to monitor the use of those managed accounts. So I think this case highlights that. Uh, the next one is actually a very similar case in the allegations, but the outcome was very different. In the Dover Corporation case, there was also a challenge uh, to a prohibited transaction that financial engines was paying, was eh, kickbacks, probably not the best word, but was paying the record keeper for access to the employees. So the managed account was added. Individuals are paying for the service, but then the provider of that managed account was paying money back to the record keeper. In Dover, the, 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 uh, the, the court said, that doesn't matter. You don't have to worry about arm's length transactions. That's not even something to consider. So we're not even going to let that claim go forward. In the AT&T case, they found completely different. So fees paid to, fi to Fidelity by the managed account provider, which is the same one, financial engines, were actually deemed to be a prohibited transaction. So uh, I don't know where this one's going to go necessarily, but I think it is definitely possible that we could, we could see another Supreme Court appeal. And you know, a few years ago, we had the Northwestern case that went to the Supreme Court. Now we have another retirement case potentially uh, working its way up there because two jurisdictions uh, came to opposite conclusions than what we came to in the Ninth Circuit here in AT&T. So, uh, you know, this is a pretty significant uh, development for plan sponsors and fiduciaries because this says you're not only responsible for knowing what you're paying your record keeper, you're also responsible for understanding what other third party services that are being offered to your participants may also be paying that record keeper. So this is definitely a new development and something that we're going to continue to monitor closely. Uh, additional ERISA litigation, I'll probably take the first two and then let uh, Candace talk about the last one. Uh, lawsuits targeting the BlackRock Life Path target date funds. Uh, I've written about these a fair amount. The challenge was the, the, the issue that I had with these uh, the, with these with these cases targeting target date funds was basically what the plaintiffs were doing was saying, hey, you only looked at the expense ratio. You didn't really consider anything else. And you did pick a very inexpensive target date fund, but we're going to go find three or four that we can compare looking back historically and say, well, these did better. So you really should have probably picked these ones that, that are doing better. And really, courts have traditionally been very unwilling to judge the, the outcome of the decision. Uh, what they should be looking at as it relates to fiduciary responsibility is what was the process that was used to arrive at your decision? We're not going to look back five years and say, well, yeah, your process was really good, but God, the outcome of the decision wasn't very good. And that's essentially what all these cases were doing. There were 11 of these brought uh, against a variety of plan sponsors, six or I think seven of them have all been dismissed. Um, surprisingly, there is one that it appears to be moving forward. Um, I had written a few blogs and other things saying that all of these should absolutely be dismissed immediately. So now that we do have one that appears to be moving forward, we will continue to, to keep an eye on that. <clears throat> uh, the other big one related to some cryptocurrency guidance that the Department of Labor put out uh, about a year and a half ago. So uh, that became a pretty hot topic last year. The DOL put out a notice that said, hey, you, if you're using cryptocurrency in your plan, we might want to come look under the hood and see what's going on. We might start look, poking around looking at your plan. Um, there are some challenges to it from an administrative standpoint, because uh, some, some organizations or uh, some, some groups said, 
well, wait a minute, DOL, you can't just make this statement. I mean, there are rules you're supposed to follow. You're sort of trying to create a rule without following the administrative procedures. But ultimately, it was just the, the, ultimately the guidance was not pulled down. Uh, that is what this lawsuit was asking to have happen, was to have the guidance removed or, or rescinded by the Department of Labor. Uh, for us all's claim was they, they were actively soliciting organizations to offer cryptocurrency within their self-directed brokerage accounts. So they said that there were at least 25% of their uh, targeted future customers quit talking to them because of this guidance, because of the threat that the EOL might look at the plan. Uh, this lawsuit ultimately was dismissed. The judge determined that even if they did grant the relief of rescinding the Department of Labor guidance, uh, it wouldn't have impacted for us all's business. So ultimately this one ended up dying. That cryptocurrency uh, guidance is still out there. Uh, one interesting other point on cryptocurrency though, when the guidance did come out a year and a half ago, about a week after it came out, Fidelity announced that they are gonna offer access to cryptocurrency within retirement plans. So I, I think the jury is still out a little bit. Well. Not on the for us all case, the jury's not out on that one, but uh, as far as uh, whether or not cryptocurrency is an appropriate investment for retirement plans. I think the last one is one that Candace has written about before, which is uh, some small plan litigation. Candace? Yeah, so uh, actually last year in our regulatory update, we saw this um, 99 cents only stories case come across uh, the dockets and it was about $75 million in assets, about 5,700 participants. Uh, it was really one of the smallest that we had ever seen. It kind of made the news for that reason because you we saw a lot of the litigation, I think, with much larger plans, you know, in the mega plan size. Uh, we were starting to see them get down to even, you know, plans within the, the mid-100 millions. Um, so seeing something under 100 million kind of piqued our interest. Uh, it turns out we just found out that the plan that the case decided to settle, uh, the settlement was in line with the percentage of assets that was similar to even other cases that were on the larger plan side. Um, so, you know, I think we're still seeing trends move in interesting directions here. It's hard to kind of predict. Uh, you know, we thought we would see a lot more moving down to the smaller plan side, given that's just where the space was, because a lot of the bigger plans had kind of, you'd say, already been sued or settled. Um, but it's nice to see that there has been a little bit of a slowdown with some of the litigation um, in regards to that space. Uh, Greg, any other insights or ads regarding you know litigation trends? No, you know we're going to continue to monitor all of these things. I, I think a lot of these, probably the ones that settle, often are the ones that give us the most insight into best fiduciary practices for a plan mm -hmm. sponsor because. What we tend to look at it's not it's not so much about the dollar amount that was included with the settlement it's it's the the non-monetary items that plan sponsors are being asked to do as a result of that settlement and those often include hiring an investment advisor going out for rfp a new one that we've seen is notifying if you have legacy assets notifying participants of their ability to move the the legacy assets so uh you know we'll continue to monitor these things and highlight those especially those that target uh, or provide insight into what best fiduciary practices are. So that brings us to the end of this year's regulatory update. The written version was released on October 1st. So if you want more information on any of the provisions that we discussed today, I would encourage you to take a look at, at that document. Uh, going forward, you know, like I said, I think the biggest issues are uh, <clears throat> on the legislative front, I think everyone needs to continue to review some of those mandatory provisions. Again, I would continue working on the Roth provision for the for or, or for the um, catch up contributions. Make sure your record keeper is prepared to begin tracking that properly at twenty by twenty twenty six. And the other big one that you need to keep an eye on from a legislative standpoint is the long term part time employees, uh, making sure that you're tracking them and providing access. Uh, also, I would probably begin thinking about some of those optional provisions. Do you want to add them? Do you not want to add them? And how prepared is your record keeper uh, to track those? Uh, not a whole lot going on with the IRS right now. Uh, from the DOL standpoint, again, I mentioned, I think the biggest thing coming probably in the next month or so will be if a final fiduciary rule is, is issued and how we react to that. I think that's certainly uh, the biggest one coming down the pike. And then, like I said, relative to litigation, we will just continue to monitor and highlight 
uh, funds or, or lawsuits, especially those that are, are specifically helpful to uh, meeting your fiduciary responsibility. All right, I do not have any questions in the chat. And so I think we will go ahead and end 10 minutes early. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.